life cycle. So, I want you to go back to your um, uh, history classes and see if you can remember what was happening in the 5th century in Italy. It was a hard century. It was a really hard century. It was um, a hard century for many people. Uh, there was lots of invasions that happened in Italy in the 5th century, and it was the collapse of the Roman Empire. And uh, I'm sure for uh, some people, including the vassal states of the Roman Empire, this was a really good thing. Uh, but for the people who were living in Italy, it was a time of tremendous turmoil and change. And one of the um, questions that was being asked is, how are we supposed to live in times of uh, upheaval and uncertainty? Does that seem familiar? Uh, one of the answers to that, classically, is a book written by Augustine of Hippo. It's called City of God. And in that book, Augustine was trying to answer that question. What does it mean to live? How are we to live well in a time that is so chaotic and unsure? And uh, one of the uh, characteristics, this kind of collapse happened in many areas of life in what we now call Italy. And one of the really interesting characteristics was a group of monks came about. And they were called the gyro vagues. Uh, gyro meaning circle, uh, and vagues meaning wander. So these were monks that would kind of wander around. They would start off in uh, one monastery. We're used to monks really kind of being rooted in one place. And that happened largely as a result of the 5th century. Because at the time there was these monks that would wander around, uh, sometimes it was because they were looking for better food. Sometimes it was because they thought they'd find a monastery that would be uh, more uh, compatible with who they were. Sometimes they just wanted a nicer habit. What they would do is they would go from monastery to monastery to monastery, because they were sure that in the next monastery, it was going to be better for them. That it was going to be much easier to get close to God there. A way to think about it is, here's a proverbial fence. Now here's some grass. If you were going to say what color that grass was, you would say? Green. Green. Green, Green. yes. Now, I want you to look on the other side of the fence. The grass is the same color green, but it doesn't always look that way. <laughs> right? You're always thinking, oh, but when I get there, it's going to be better, it's going to be easier, it's going to be uh, the life that I want to live, and I'm going to have a sense of God's presence so much more clearly. This was one of the essential challenges that uh, Christianity, and especially those living in monasteries, were facing in this century. And so on the scene comes Benedict of Nursia. Now, uh, just you know, so you know, you can see it spelled Nursia like this in case you, know, you find it that way. It's in central Italy, no matter how you spell it. Uh, Benedict was born in the year 480, died at about 66 or 67 years old in the middle of the 6th century. He uh, was one of the most important um, figures in, not just in Europe in the 5th century, but the influence that Benedict had was so profound that he was eventually canonized, so he became uh, Saint Benedict of Nursia wasn't canonized, interestingly, until 1220. But over time, Benedict has become the patron saint of Europe, along with Saints uh, Cyril, Cyril and Methodius, uh, because he lived uh, by himself in a cave. He's also 
the patron saint of cavers, <laughs> or uh, spelunkers. Uh, he is, understandably, the patron saint of monks, because the ways that he reformed monasticism in the 5th century and 6th century just uh, opened it up for lots and lots of people. He's the patron saint of gallstones. Uh, in case that's an issue, you know who to pray to. <laughs> and uh, just for fun, he's also the patron saint of metal rashes. I think it's fair to say that lots of people turn to Benedict to find out how to live life. And this was something that started early on. So this is actually a picture of the hill country of central Italy, as you might expect. Uh, and Benedict, as a young man, wanted to be able, uh, he, was, he went to Rome to study and found it to be just, um, it kind of disgusted him, frankly. Uh, the, the people who were there, he didn't feel like they really gave themselves to the Christian life. And so he decided that he was going to go off on his own. And so uh, near the town of Subiaco, he went. Now there are some um, stories that also have uh, his, uh, an old nurse who accompanies him. So we don't know, like, was he really by himself? But what he did is he went up into this valley and found this cave. And he hung out in this cave because he thought, uh, surely I will be able to come close to God here. Uh, then, over time, other people noticed how uh, um, just incredibly wise and thoughtful Benedict was, and they came to join him. Now, uh, not everybody liked what Benedict did. In fact, he survived two bouts of poisoning by jealous monks at the time. But uh, there was enough people that gathered around him because they could tell that the pattern of life he lived gave him life. He came close to God and they could see that. And I think this is actually part of what makes Benedict kind of brilliant, is that he could recognize patterns and be able to distill them down to their essences so that people could live by them. And so one of the most famous patterns that he found got put down into the rule of St. Benedict. And there are um, monasteries, and there are Christians around the world to this day, you know, 1,500 years later, that are still adhering to that rule. Uh, another pattern that he discovered, or that he found really useful, is the pattern of work and study and prayer. And that is a, a balanced way to engage in life, and so you see Benedictine monasteries and communities across the world still hold to that pattern of work, study, and prayer. And then there's this pattern. And so this is uh, what we have come to understand as a Benedictine life cycle. And it's composed of three main components, stability and obedience and conversion of life. I'd like to start actually in stability, because I feel like that's um, what most of the time we kind of feel like we are in. Now stability, it's really important to see that stability is not stasis. It's not just doing the same thing over and over and over. Um, several years ago, when I first came across this uh, model, somebody was talking, who's a surfer, was talking about what it's like to surf. and so. When you're surfing, if you're on a surfboard, right, you're in the middle of a wave, if you stand straight up and stay in the same place the whole time, you're going to fall over very, very quickly. Because stability is actually about balance, and about balance in motion, because things are always changing. And so in order to, be, uh, to have the kind of stability that Benedict, uh, Benedict talked about, you have to have a sense of, of groundedness. Um, and in particular, and this is where the 20th century writer Esther DeWall was really helpful in her book Seeking God. Um, it's accepting a particular community or place or people as the way to God. It's not looking to that next place 
where God will be. And so uh, what Esther DeWall reminds us is that God is not elsewhere. So, that's, uh, that's what stability is. It's recognizing that God is not elsewhere, and even with that, there are times when um, we notice that something is becoming stale, or it's becoming tired, or uh, there's a rigidity that is set in. That does not mean we need to go somewhere else, that we're done with these people, we're done with this place. Uh, but it means that we need to start listening. And so, uh, there is this next uh, way of being in the Benedictine life cycle is obedience. Now, um, I live in Berkeley, California. This might as well be a four-letter word, obedience. Uh, but, have no fear. Uh, because at the heart of obedience is this word, obedir which is Latin, and it means to listen. And so obedience is actually about listening, and about a depth of listening. What Esther DeWall says is a lifelong learning, which is listening to the word of God, to the rule, to the brethren, to the abbot, right? This is how Benedict understood obedience. And so it's the kind of listening that you have to take time for. And so when you're coming out of a place of stability, you actually have to set aside time for obedience, for the real deep listening that allows you to discern that still small voice of what is possible next. Because if you're listening, you can lean into the possibility of conversion of life. So conversion of life, uh, so it's uh, kind of a, a looking to the horizon um, an, uh, an awareness that something can change uh, for you, for the people you're with, for the community you're in. And uh, again, Esther DeWall says it's a commitment to total inner transformation. And it's not something that we have to do on our own. This is actually something that God does with and in and through us. The conversion of life is, uh, is a moment or a series of moments, and it's this new way, and it's fantastic, and what on God's green earth do you do with it? Right? Because if it's just on its own, and you can't actually live it out, then what good is it to the people around you, to yourself, to God? And so the next turn then, to get back into stability, is to literally inhabit this new way of being. And you do this through a new rhythm, through a new sense of balance, and through a new sense of stability. One of the things that um, I have learned about living in this pattern for a while is that at the core of this model, and of each move, is trust. And it's trust in God that where you are now, that there can be a deepening or a change, and that you can listen for it. That God will be there when you listen. It takes trust to do that, because it's really easy just to, um, well, to pretend as if all we have now is all we're, always, all we're ever going to get. And so, to be able to trust that when you listen, God will speak, it's actually significant. And then when you're in that listening, and, and, and you're hearing something, being able to trust that it leads into new life. Right? Again, it's an easy thing to want to stay there, because is that life really for me? And then when you come to that new place, can you trust that, um, that you can live it out? We have uh, time and time again, also in our Gospels, we have these uh, stories of Jesus healing somebody. They come to this new place of life, and the people around them can't trust that new life is actually possible. And then, 
Can you trust that you can live it out? That this is not just for that day. So I think you can recognize this pattern uh, all over the place. Uh, liturgically, in the Episcopal Church, uh, the Lutheran Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the liturgical churches, uh, you could see that maybe stability is like ordinary time. Uh, you're living uh, day by day, week by week, and you've got a, a stability and a rootedness to it. And then we come to times like, say, Lent, when we come to a deeper place of listening. And we're asking new questions or allowed new questions to be asked of us. Listening, where is God in this? And then we lean into the possibility of something like Easter. And to this great mystery uh, that new life is possible. And Easter inevitably then leads back into ordinary time and living this out again. You can look at scripture. Uh, a story of somebody like uh, Saul of Tarsus, say, who lived in a, a kind of stability, right, zealous in his sense of righteousness, and then uh, gets hit on the road to Damascus, is blinded, but doesn't have the conversion of life immediately, right? He has to listen. Uh, he has to be guided by people who he does not know. He doesn't know. He, all he has is trust that God has something still in store for him, and goes, and then it's when Ananias lays hands on him, the scales fall, and he then is uh, brought into the life of this new community to practice it. So how might we practice it? I mean, I think this is a really good model, but this model can't be lived with good as it for. So, what scale does this work for? This is one of those great patterns that I think you can see on an individual level, with small groups, with congregations, maybe within like nations. I mean, like, this is an incredibly scalable way of looking at life. So as an individual, how does this uh, cycle work? Well, uh, when you're in a place of stability, um, either when you're in a place of chaos, or a place of boredom, it is really easy to wonder if I'm not feeling God right now, if it's, if it's a dry time in my life, well, maybe I will feel God when I get that new job, or when I'm in a new relationship, or when the new iPhone finally comes out, right? In fact, God is still here, right, for us all the time. But there are times when we need to listen. And so how do we listen? We listen through uh, our prayer. We listen in silence. We listen through scripture. There are some times when you've heard the same scriptural story over and over and over again, but you're in this particular place, and all of a sudden you hear something that you didn't before. We listen through our mind, our heart, our body. Our bodies tell us things. I believe they often come from God. And then lastly, uh, out of that obedience, we come into conversion of life. And that is an openness to new life in ourselves and in other people. Uh, ways that this might work out in a congregation. Because congregations are, uh, as a congregation, somewhere often in this cycle, in different parts of a congregation, will be in different places on the cycle. Uh, so what would stability look like? Again, God isn't some other place or some other time, like when we get um, new neighbors, or when we finally get the young families we've been hoping for, or when our budget is finally balanced. Uh, God is here and now, and that is something that we can trust. So what do listening practices look like for a congregation? Well, uh, that can come, again, through silence, in your liturgy, uh, in your meetings, Lectio Divina, Centering Prayer, things like that. Group processes are great ways to listen uh, for where is the Spirit now? And this is one of the things that, um, as 21st century Christians, I feel like... Um, 
this is where we often uh, stop, right here. All right, there's, there's enough, going back to the 5th century in Italy, there's enough chaos and uncertainty in our lives, and particularly in our churches, that we go, hmm, is new life really possible for us? And there's a trust we need to have that the Spirit is already ahead of us and waiting. And it, it's not going to look like it did here. It's not going to look like the 1950s or the 1870s or the 520s. It's going to look different. But the Spirit is waiting and new life is ready for us. So, that is... Um, a look at the Benedictine life cycle. And as I said before, it is a highly adaptive uh, way of seeing life in a congregation, life, uh, the, the personal life we have in the Christian faith. And so let's take a look at what we would use something like this for. So if I were going to do uh, an assessment or a diagnosis of where things were in a congregation, uh, would I use the Benedictine life cycle? Sure. Uh, I think that you can use this as a tool to look at where, uh, where, the, where does this part of this body seem to be, and particularly, what are the questions that are being asked next? That's a really great way to use this as a diagnostic tool, because a lot of times uh, we get stuck and so there are ways you can ask questions to find out what's next. Teaching and formation, absolutely. Uh, this is a highly intuitive model and one that I think uh, uh, people, at least as I've taught it in the congregation where I serve, they, they pick it up immediately and they see all kinds of ways in their life. Data collection, I think that can be used that way as well. It's not, um, it may not give you as much data as some of the other models that have a lot more um, moving parts to it, but you can still uh, get a lot of, out of it. Diagnosis of, uh, excuse me, uh, development of common language, for sure. Uh, if you can uh, say uh, to someone, gosh, I'm in a place of obedience right now, I'm just trying to listen to where God is, and they know what that means, and then kind of uh, can help pray for or guide you into that conversion of life. It be really powerful. Leadership and strategy, just used it at our vestry retreat last month. Um, and again, it reinvigorated uh, the trust we have in what can happen next. Lastly, uh, direction, vision, goals. Um, this one, I think you can use, use this for that. It is probably, um, again, it's uh, more, uh, there's a lot of theory in this, but you can use it, uh, I think, to touch the ground and, uh, and put yourself where you believe God is calling you next. And that is the Benedictine Life Model.